I don't want to make this conversation about Lenny, but since I can tell you feel very strongly and highly about him, I think I, I can ask this question. I am a big fan of him. I love his books. No. I I think some of his ideas are, are really out there and they're on the frontier. They're not substantiated by hard evidence, but I think that that's part of, of science. Now, philosophers in general, though, that I talk to about his work do not think so highly of him. And what I want to ask you about is what makes him, to you, such an important and inspiring physicist. Yeah, Lenny has just a wild intuition. And he he kind of just like feels it at first, it seems to me. I can't speak for what his actual inner process is, but um, it seems to me he has a strong intuition for something. And he will just find a way of expressing it. It's not always completely computed. Um, it's not always follow the chalk from the beginning of a mathematical proposition to, you know, a series of theorems. It's it's not always like that specifically. Maybe that's what the philosophers object to, but I, you know, I'm I, I'm always gonna listen to what Lenny says because he just keeps having these incredibly insightful ideas. And duality was one of them, complementarity was one of them, um, holography is another. Now they're talking about things like ER equals EPR. And even if we don't pick apart all of those things. They have been incredibly influential. And so holography, his idea on holography, it doesn't matter exactly how he initially framed it, but you can, one way to see why, why there was something right there. You could, you know, he, he had an intuition about something that clearly is right there. The idea of a hologram is that you encode in two dimensions all of the information to project the illusion of a three-dimensional thing. And what Lenny was insisting is the black hole is a hologram because all of the information can be packed on the event horizon surface. No more information can exist in the interior of a black hole than you have on the area of, of the horizon. That's formally true if you calculate things like Hawking radiation. What's the entropy of the radiation? Entropy is a measure of information. The entropy scales like the area, not the volume of the black hole. So he, had, he knew something we all knew but he said it in a really clever way. And he, he got everyone to go, oh, wait, yeah, that's, that's actually something really important. So Lenny, I don't know if he would go as far as to say this now, but it drove people to consider, well, maybe there is no interior about the, of the black hole. Forget about the singularity not existing. There's no interior. Everything, it's a hologram. Everything is just on the surface. And so if it's like, some string theory model, maybe the description is as the string approaches the event horizon, it smears out over that event horizon in this stringy configuration and it never falls through in some sense. Or there's complementary descriptions. The, the astronaut that falls through the event horizon thinks they fall through, but to us out here, it never fell through and both those things are true. They're just, there's no omniscient observer who can see the, see the conflict or the um, yeah, the paradox. So his ideas are unbelievably profitable uh, for the community. And, um, and even something like holography and this kind of a duality of the interior and the exterior was eventually made precise by Juan Maldacena in a specific model of a universe in a box where he basically shows uh, uh, the universe in a box I can completely describe completely accurately in a different description, which is just the surface of the box and the interior doesn't exist in some sense or, or it's just a different description. I don't need the interior of the box. So anyway, it's just to say eventually somebody makes it precise. I had an absolutely lovely two-hour conversation with Juan Maldacena all about, all about ADS-CFT, which as you, you bring it up, I mean, it could be by some metrics the most cited high-energy particle physics paper of I all think time. it's the most highly cited theoretical physics paper period of all yes. time. And not only that, but it's it's not just that it's highly cited. Something like four of the top five most highly cited papers, like Witten's follow-up, they all have to do with holography and ADS-CFT. Mm -hmm. But if I were to speculate about philosophers' feelings about Lenny, I would 
I think that the the brunt of their feelings could be attributed to three things. One, they are retaliating against his perceived hostility to philosophers because he's not a huge I'm fan. A little sympathetic. With yeah, that too. I, I I understand <laughs> with him too. On yeah, his no, side. I mean there are there are some good philosophers of physics, and there are You're a lot. You're not going to philosophy a rocket into space. Yes, yeah, <laughs> uh, I get it. I get it. Second, I think that they view the pushing of string theory so hard as irresponsible because they more they side more with Peter Voigt, who is another silly. yeah <laughs> an, another colleague of yours yeah. at Columbia. And then the third thing, and this is where maybe it, it might be worth a few minute digression if you have any thoughts on this, is that they think that the anthropic principle and his thinking about the fine tuning problem is just totally crazy. So philosophers agree that the fine tuning problem is a very interesting problem, whether or not it will eventually dissolve and, and not be a problem at all. But I'm wondering if, I mean, fine tuning is the sort of thing that could keep me up at night. I'm wondering if it's something that you think about at all. And if so, maybe you could explain what the problem is well, before you. Well, let me just, just not to pose too ardent a defense of Lenny, but um, I don't believe Lenny will stick to uh, something wrong. You show him something's wrong and he'll accept it. Um, this happened with the firewall uh, era. I don't know if you followed that, but... I know firewalls are part of your book, so would you want to talk about this for a minute before it's, we... It's a little bit tricky, but... Um, We'd have to kind of go through the whole Hawking okay. radiation. We'll but come we, back we, can, to that. we can talk about it a little bit, but but essentially, um, the the firewall crisis was one that showed that complementarity could not be, in some sense, completely respected. This idea that oh, if you fall in, there's nobody who can know that you fell in, and also. Um, simultaneously have the point of view that you were on the outside. They actually showed that there was a real problem with some of Lenny's thinking. Let's just put it that way, just to make it simpler. And uh, of course he accepted what they were saying. He was flipped out. He was irritated. He was grouchy. Um, but he didn't deny what was shown to him. So I completely uh, do not like this attitude that just because somebody has explored a possibility that they're somehow religiously adhering to it um, with, you know, in some unreasonable way against all evidence to the contrary. That's not Lenny. That's not what I've seen ever. So I think if you showed him holography was wrong, he would be like, ah, oh, damn, you know, like supersymmetry didn't work out so well. Bummer, you know. Right. Move on. And holography, as we've just mentioned, it remains a vital part on the frontier of theoretical physics. And Juan Maldacino, we, you said ADSC of T, just since you have a very general audience, it's an anti sitter space in the volume. And C of T, a conformal field theory on the boundary, it was a precise example of holography. Right. And then, boom, holography was like, it went from being Lenny's intuition and fascinating to, to, to uh, convincing Stephen Hawking that he should capitulate, that they had found a solution to the information loss pro um, problem. So... So holography has done well <laughs> in yeah, that yeah. sense.